Welcome to Church Online this morning. It's great to have you with us, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, whether you're uh, joining us on Sunday or whether you're joining, tuning in to us uh, later on the week. It's, it's wonderful to have you uh, with us. And we are very, very blessed uh, today as part of our worship that we've got our new superintendent, uh, the Reverend Adrian Burden, coming to, uh, to give us uh, our uh, sermon, our message uh, today. But uh, more of that uh, later as we move through our worship. But let me just read for you some verses from Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, his love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders his love endures forever. So let's come and lift our voices and our hearts and our minds to God in praise and worship as we sing the great traditional hymn of Great is Thy Faithfulness. <laughs> Not 
Almighty God, creator of all that is, you are worthy of all praise. For not only is the universe vast, varied and full of wonder, it's also consistent and reliable. It works to your pattern. It obeys your laws. We can depend on the regular succession of tides, of seasons, of day and night, of life and death. In creation, in redemption, your word is your deed and we worship and adore you. Lord Jesus Christ, the word became flesh. You're worthy of all praise, for your deeds were always consistent with your words. You told others to be humble in spirit, and yet you lived a life of humble service, even to the extent of kneeling and washing the disciples' feet. You told others to trust in God and obey his will, and you walked the way of obedience and faith from the wilderness to Gethsemane, from Gethsemane to Calvary. You told others to love and forgive, and you loved to the end and forgave those, even those who nailed you to the cross. We worship and adore you. Forgive us, Lord Jesus, that our deeds so often fail to match up with our words. Like Peter, we're ready to boast our allegiance one moment and to deny you the next. We failed in humble service. We failed in trust and obedience. We failed in love and forgiveness. Forgive us, Lord Jesus. As you renewed Peter and called him to shepherd your sheep, we pray that you will renew us and recall us to your service so that we may praise you not only with our lips, but in our lives for your name's sake and to your glory. Amen. Bless 
Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful with trees of abundance. Everything be my everything. 
So let's pray for others. O oh Lord, we bring before you the griefs, the worries, the concerns, the peril of people and of nations. O oh merciful Father, comfort and relieve them all. We bring before you the need of the homeless, those who are financially, financially struggling, for those who face difficult choices in their work or, or struggles and worries and anxieties in their careers, for those who are just seeking to find a job to make ends meet. O oh, merciful Father, comfort and relieve them. We bring before you those who, who are helpless and feel helpless. For those who are elderly and affirm. For those who are lonely. For those who are vulnerable. For those who are weak. For those who are isolated. For those who are shielding. O oh, merciful Father, comfort and relieve them. We bring before you the sighs and the troubles of those who are persecuted for their faith in you. O oh, merciful Father, comfort and relieve your church. We bring before you the pains of those who are sick, who are poorly, who are unwell. For those who struggle with their physical or mental or emotional health. O oh, merciful Father, comfort and relieve them. And we bring before you, O oh Lord, those who are on our hearts and on our minds this morning. Comfort and relieve them. Comfort and relieve all of these people, these situations, these places, according to their needs. For the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Make me.
reading is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. The parable of the tenants in the vineyard. Listen to another parable Jesus said. There was once a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a hole for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he let out the vineyard to tenants and went on a journey. When the time came to gather the grapes, he sent his slaves to the tenants to receive his share of the harvest. The tenants seized his slaves, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, the man sent out other slaves, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. Surely they will re respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the owner's son. Come on, let's kill him and we will get his property. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Jesus asked. He will certainly kill those evil men, they answered, and let the vineyard out to other tenants who will give him his share of the harvest at the right time. Jesus said to them, haven't you ever read what the scriptures say? The stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out to be the most important of all. This was done by the Lord. What a wonderful sight it is. And so I tell you, added Jesus, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce the proper fruits. The chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables and knew that he was talking about them. So they tried to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowds who considered Jesus to be a prophet. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be worthy of you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Being preached to on a parable can sometimes feel like you're at the Grand Canyon and the tour guide is standing right in your line of vision, getting in the way. Or you are meandering through a stunning art gallery and the curator stops right in the middle of the masterpiece to talk about it. Or oh, you're about to take a bite of a Parisian delicacy and you are pummeled by the list of ingredients and an extensive discussion on how it was created. Whilst it is important to know that you're looking at the Grand Canyon and not a mountain when you first walk up to that rim, you don't actually want anyone talking in your face. When you're about to behold a masterpiece for the first time, you want it to hit you in the gut, to flood your centre with its power. When you're about to taste something magnificent on your tongue, you're not going to want all the facts about the ingredients at that precise moment. There is a place, of course, for all those details about geological history and artistic tradition and regional cuisine, but not at the exact moment that you are trying to experience the wonderful creation. Parable are these precious gems and we preachers often like to smash them open and see what's inside. These tightly packed tales are meant to confound and amaze, to evoke and provoke, to hit you in the gut and to run a shiver down your spine. Their creative power is more forceful in your experience of it than in any explanation of it. So, whatever it was that you felt as you heard our gospel text read to you this morning, keep that in your mind, keep it with you and treasure it. Whatever immediately struck you when you let this gem wash over you, tuck that away and return to it. 
If it was anger, or confusion, or disbelief, or amazement, hold on to that experience. It will be the key for your imaginative engagement with this parable. As for the preacher, there are many perils ahead. We are required to remark on such a text, even if we are tempted to let the parable do all the work and sit back down and say no more. But we must risk ruining your experience, even if for a moment, to offer a few remarks on this parable. At worst, this sermon will smash the gem before you, the one that glimmered before you just a moment ago. At best, it may shine a dim light onto this gem so that its hues deepen ever so slightly. I guess we are aiming for something between the two. There is much that could be said about this parable. We could discuss the basic structure and the arc of the story. There are tenants who kill everyone who comes to get the harvest of the vineyard and even the son of the landowner. We could remark upon the overt resonances it shares with the Isaiah chapter 5 in the Old Testament, another passage about a vineyard. Though Isaiah is much more interested in the destruction of the vineyard itself than those who go to the vineyard to collect its harvest. Then there's the way that each character in our parable is matched up with figures in the ancient world. The slaves, likely to stand in for the various prophets through Israel's history. Jesus, of course, himself is easily recognised as the son of the landowners. And perhaps the tenants are the notorious Pharisees, Sadducees, the chief priests, the religious leaders. But one part of this story that is worth noticing and lingering on is the simple fact that Jesus does not finish his own parable. He sets up an entire story without an ending. Instead, he ends his parable by asking a question to his listeners, the chief priests, the Pharisees. He asks them, now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And filled with a great sense of justice and a dash of vengeance, the listeners answer Jesus, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to another tenant who will give him the produce at harvest time. And Jesus lets their answer go, neither confirms nor contradicts it. But soon, after some further explanation by Jesus, it dawns on those chief priests and Pharisees, are we those violent tenants? Is he talking about us? Have we rejected and killed the slaves and sons of the landowners? Is he blaming us for the rejection of Israel's prophets? And in their violent and vindictive answer, the chief priests and the Pharisees indict themselves. They name the punishment they would give their own behaviour. And it is a harsh one. The issue at hand is their rejection of the prophets of the Lord. And ultimately, their rejection of the Lord's Son. Because as we know, their rejection matched with the Roman authorities' power to execute, will lead to Jesus' actual death. That they have rejected Jesus does not entirely exist solely on the plane of parables, but also on the very real hill at Calvary. What is it to us? So what? Some chief priests and Pharisees 2,000 years ago rejected Jesus as the Son of God, what might that have to do with us? That Jesus was rejected by those who came to save is evident in our lives too. We cannot be too quick to distance ourselves from those who are unable to see Jesus for who he was in that time, at age. But they are us 
and we are them. Their rejection of Jesus is our own inevitable participation in Good Friday. Our own complicity in the death-dealing forces of this world, our own inability to see before us the Son of God. This is where the parable threatens to shatter us. <clears throat> we take part in big and small ways in the death of Jesus should be no surprise in our neglect of the poor, our dismissal of the outcast, our apathy towards the migrant. We do our part in rejecting Jesus. That we so quickly pick and choose the teachings of Jesus that we'd like to follow and those we wouldn't is our participation in his rejection. That we judge the sins of others but refuse to see our own is how we continue to reject the grace and the forgiveness offered in the person of Jesus. That we sing praises of his name and then shout crucify him as part of the angry crowd is our rejection of our Lord. But again, we'll do well to remember that Jesus does not finish the parable. What he does is offer a quotation from Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That Jesus still came and comes to those he knew would reject him may be the most vibrous and wondrous gem of all. That he would willingly give himself over to the authorities and principalities and walk through the door of death is the luminous truth we are called to behold today. Despite our rejection, our complicity, our failings, our judgments, our violent ways, our self-wielding indictments, despite all of ourselves, Jesus comes to us and he is for us and with us. Jesus will ultimately finish this parable when he bursts through the tomb of death he will finish the parable when he rises from the grave you see the answer to the question when the owners of the vineyard comes what will he do to those tenants is found in the resurrection of jesus the answer to the parable's question is grace Grace upon grace for all who have rejected him. It is forgiveness. It is new life. It is always another chance. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. Breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory. The King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Chaos back in 
Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. So as we bring our worship once again to a close uh, and we think uh, about what we are going to do and face for the rest of the day or the rest of this week, may you go into it all in peace. May you go having courage, holding on to what is good, returning no one evil for evil. May you go and strengthen the faint hearted, support the weak and help the suffering. Honour all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit as you go. And may the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. We have a strong and certain hope Fixed and unchanging, not in vain. We have a